you've got to write the script in advance because there's no script existing and you've got to really create that before you execute. Otherwise, people are going to get hurt and, and equipment's going to get wrecked. Still, you need a lot of skill to work these things. To, to spot when it's not going right. Yeah, you know, I think this is a great place for industry to be moving is this risk-based approach to how you're doing your planning. Welcome to the ITI Lights podcast for leaders in industrial technology, education, and safety, where we talk to thought leaders in construction and heavy industries in this exciting time of rapid innovation. In this episode, ITI CEO Zach Parnell had a great conversation about lift planning and rigging engineering with ITI founder Mike Parnell, Chief Rigging Engineer of Bechtel Keith Anderson, and President of JL Yates Services and former SCP of Engineering for Barnhart Crane and Rigging, Jim Yates. Thanks, gentlemen, for joining us today. We had a we had a late night and a early morning, didn't we? Um, Dad, we we retired you twelve hours ago, and here you are. <laughs> Brought him out of retirement. Good job. Yeah, twelve <laughs> hours of retirement, and um, he's back at it again. Yeah, so. we were wondering how long it would last. Yeah, twelve hours. Yeah, we <laughs> we had a we had a retirement celebration last night for my dad and mom and. Um, and today we have Keith and Jim, uh, full bios coming soon, but Keith Anderson, Chief Rigging Engineer for Bechtel, thank you for joining us. And Jim Yates, um, former Senior Vice President of Technical Services Engineering for Barnhart Crane and, and a myriad of other, other things we're going to get into. But uh, And then my father, Dad, uh, Dad Parnell, right? <laughs> Mike Parnell, uh, Founder and Technical Director of ITI. So here just having a conversation about... Um, Construction, rigging, engineering, lift planning, and all those all those things. We got a cool assortment of um, gadgets and like models. Um, we're going to get some heat from from the OEMs that aren't represented on the table, right? But uh, <laughs> anyways, let's start with bios. I'd love to for the listeners to know know about uh, you guys from your from your voice. So, uh, Dad, would you mind starting? Well, I have a background that started in the wire rope industry and uh, related to cranes and rigging um, and also drag lines, oil and gas and different applications, and then moved eventually over into consulting um, and then training for uh, particularly for rigging. And we hired in and brought in other extra folks to help supplement for crane operations. And so since... Uh, probably over 30 years, at least with the company, uh, it has a broad menu selection of crane and rigging uh, associated training programs at all levels and audits, accident investigation, consulting activities. So uh, most of us and most of our folks are qualified either as riggers, qualified operators, uh, overhead or mobile crane operators and so on. So have a pretty, very good um, stable of people that that uh, through ITI that uh, can provide a whole host of services. So I'm just stepping back as um, past technical director, serving maybe as a part-time senior uh, consultant now and working on special projects to finish out and uh, looking forward to some some time off and travel, enjoying uh, getting around. But uh, we, we, we still want to finish out the things that we've committed to. And I really appreciate <coughs> the op- opportunity to be here today. Thank you. Uh, Keith, please. Yeah, uh, where to start? Yeah. I did a, a degree in mechanical engineering, and uh, while I was doing that, I was a student apprentice. And the company I worked for did high pressure hydraulic systems, braking systems, ten thousand psi stuff. So uh, I, I got quite a quite a background on, on hydraulics, and that was really my gateway into lifting because we we saw an advert one day for a company that had moved into the village of all things and uh, a lifting company company called Cramo Montage, which was of Swedish origin. And they did uh, hydraulic lifting. So it was all kind of generators and chemical vessels and things using a, a hydraulic climbing jack. So for them, my hydraulic side was was the gateway to it. So uh, went and joined those guys. The first the first job I got to do was a, a bridge slide of all things. They were they were doing the M25 around London at that time and they'd built a a bridge alongside the existing line. They grubbed up underneath it. We had the job of pulling this thing sideways, weighing about 1,200 tons. And uh, the boss at the time said, you know, would you go check John's calculations? And I said, well, where are they? You know, <laughs> no calculations. So uh, 
he just kind of done it off the spur. But they were using the climbing jacks horizontally as as linear winches. So uh, anyway, I did some calcs, and of course that was my first job, and I was very very nervous because they were pulling against the sill girders with a, a you know to, to heave the thing across, and it was it was brass greased brass they were using as the, as the sliding medium. Mm. This thing had a joint in the middle of it, and they were concerned that if we didn't pull exactly evenly, this, this joint would fail, you know. But uh, anyway, it all went okay eventually in the end. And uh, and uh, through the years, we were chemical vessel lifts for companies, including Bechtel, uh, all over the globe, you know, went to Indonesia, the Philippines, Malaysia, and all these kind of places. Uh, and at that time, 200 tons was a heavy lift. And we were just making it up as we went along. There was no rules. You know, how do you guy a mass system? I don't know, just we'll figure this out. How do we design a lifting beam? Well, we, we got a structural engineer in and threw some percentages at it. And all of it was just learn on the job. There was nothing to to guide you. There was no standards. There was no nothing. And uh, the only thing that was useful out there was the, the Chain Testers Association, which became the LEEA. They put some stuff out. Yeah. And... Uh, Anyway, we we did a lot of very interesting lifts, and uh, the company eventually went bust lifting a big crane down in uh, Florida, 3,200 tons, and uh, we completed the job, but it just broke the company. And uh, at that time, went to join Van Sermeren, which is the, the Dutch lifting company. Uh, quite a few people from from Cremo went, and, well, Wally and Wally and I went to join them, and uh, he was the MD of the UK end, and uh, I was the the chief engineer for them. And so we started getting more into cranes and stuff. This was the the time when Franz had just bought into some DMAG 4800s and wanted to go from being just a Dutch company into, into having to go more international. And Wally being the sales guy and me being the engineering guy uh, was, his, was his gateway to people like the Bechtels and the Loomises and the Stone and Websters and all that. So we... Uh, we sat in the UK engineering and bidding jobs for, for Van Sermeren, which is the company that eventually became Mammut or amalgamated with Mammut. Mm. So we were there, you know, with, with Franz at the time when he was taking this big leap of faith, you know. And, uh, so uh, through that, got to know about crawler cranes, AutoCAD, all this kind of good stuff. Never had that at Cremo, but learned how to use AutoCAD at uh, Van Sermeren and uh, uh, SPMTs and skidding. Well, I already knew about skidding systems, but over the years got gradually more and more mainstream. And uh, anyway, uh, came <coughs> came a time when uh, I was over in Oakland looking at a job there for for Van Sermeren and uh, met up with a guy I knew a little bit, a guy called Ali Mirage, who was a, was the Bechtel chief rigging engineer at the time. And uh, he said, "I'm looking to retire." He said, "How would you like to?" To take over, I said, "Well, you know, tell me a bit more about it." You know, and he said, "Well, it would be in Kentucky." I thought, "Well, that's that's that sounds a bit more interesting than uh, than Texas." You know, where I've been to Texas many times over the years, and I thought it sounded interesting. He said, uh, "Well, you have to do a year in London to start with, uh, you know, for the visa issues and all the rest of it." So I, I spent a year working in London and uh, came over to Louisville, which is where Bechtel Equipment was. The the rigging group is based to to Bechtel Equipment, and uh, that's where they were for the first five years, and uh, eventually they moved out to Houston, which is exactly where I didn't want to be, so <laughs> uh, we we agreed I could work out of the house, and that all worked out, but, but over the years, I got more and more mainstream and more and more corporate, come to understand, uh, you know, through through associations with with Mike and the ASME and all the rest of it, come to understand how the, the standards work, how OSHA works. Uh, how things work in the U.S. Union, non-union, all that kind of good stuff, and uh, got involved in the ASME P30 lift planning standard, where Mike was chairing, and uh, latterly got myself involved in the SPMT one that's that's under development. Uh, and uh, th through association with Mike, came to know Mike, and uh, he gave me the push to get my my long drafted book pulled together and published. So uh, ITI now publish Rigging Engineering Basics and uh, the one that came along after it, Rigging Engineering. And uh, through that, uh, the ENR eventually recognized me as one of the newsmakers 
2015, and uh, Bechtel recognised me, and uh, so it's all been it's all been a very fruitful association. And uh, I'm continuing with Bechtel at the moment as chief rigging engineer. We're we're looking to the future and where it's all going to go to, and how to do things bigger and better. And uh, got about another year to do probably, and uh, pass the buck on to someone else. So uh, yeah. That's Did where you, we're at. But uh, the award you got with Ian Bechtel was really interesting because uh, what was the award called again? It's uh, distinguished and Bechtel distinguished engineer. The, uh, all, all, they had a, a relatively small pool of mm-hmm. of people that they recognise as distinguished engineers and scientists, but all those people were always on the engineering and scientific side, and I was I was the first one to ever come from the construction side of things. Yeah, uh, so that was. Interesting. Yeah, that was what was profound about it, right? Because, yeah, uh, that was profound. They've, they've since uh, expanded the program a bit, so they're trying to get more people involved from the from the construction side. But this was the the first time. And, uh, yeah, I was I was wondering a bit, you know, how Bechtel would view the the publication of the book, and I was just thinking to do it when I retired. But uh, uh, once I'd gone along to the legal guys and said, "Here's what I'm thinking of doing," and uh, yeah, it was all go, you know, and, uh, and they've 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 enthusiastically embraced it, so yeah, that was part of how how I ended up there. Yeah, well, we should come back to the your you have you're very passionate about professionalizing uh, the rigging engineer role, and it's really ironic. Uh, you, for a long time, you published a newsletter called the Professional Rigger, right? Yeah, and uh, we're going to get into the history of this industry and the the do- the job work task of rigging. Yeah, but the. Uh, um, as I was telling you earlier on, there, the uh, I had to learn it all. Mm-hmm. So you're pulling a little bit from structural, a bit from mechanical, a bit of hydraulic, a bit from uh, geotech, a bit from the cr- uh, the crane guys themselves. You know, a bit from the rigging guys, and all these different bits of disciplines all come into lift planning, which of course is what I was doing. I was lift planning rather than executing. So my interest was how how is it you know that we can you know we can let people plan lifts. That have basically no knowledge, <laughs> there's no no formal training in how to do it. So what I wanted to do was to pass on, you know, the the lessons I'd learned. And I genuinely believe it's it's an omission that we we can allow people to plan lifts that have no no formal training or, or qualification to do that. We don't allow it in anything else. Then you want to you want to fly a plane. You got to go and spend some extensive time learning how to do it. You know, mm-hmm. and it's a high risk activity. You know, we 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 need to make sure the people that are doing this type of work. And I'm talking particularly about the planning end of it. I mean, there's training for riggers, there's training for lift directors, there's there's, there's training for that, but not not for rigging engineers, mm-hmm. not for people who want to sit down and engineer it and. Uh, it's gradually coming. They're starting to become things like the BTH standard you can refer to and all this kind of good stuff, you know. But uh, I still think it's an omission that there's no formal qualification or training. You know, recognizing that rigging is many things. It's not just right. one thing, but the basics of it are, are common to all branches of rigging. Yeah. I'm recalling um, five years ago, yeah. I think all four of us were in a room across the building here well, after you wrote the book to start putting together the online, the rigging engineering online program, remember that? Right, right. Yep. The yep. agenda for it. And it was really out of your passion that there's just never been a formal training program for rigging engineers. And uh, we, you, you all had since built that program with 20 other top engineers around the world. Um, and ASME, a credit, or uh, they, they provide CEUs for it now, which is awesome. Every, every mm-hmm. student gets a, a membership to ASME, but it's you're you're chipping away at professionalizing that uh, in an incredible way here at the um, near the end of your career. So I gotta say, well, well done, and uh, it's been neat to see. I, we've had I think there's o- been over about seven hundred, eight hundred people that have gone through that program. Yeah. Um, so it's making an impact. Yeah. The other aspect of it too, which we'll probably get into, I'm sure, is. It's becoming much more techno technology technological. Yeah, <laughs> the yeah. technology is definitely. I mean, time was with a crane. You could go and look at a crane chart. It'd be one sheet of paper. You might have one for a fly jib. It might be a second sheet of paper. But right. you might have a super lift on the third sheet. But now these books of crane charts are inches thick. 
then that's if you're even going to get a green chart. Some of it now is continuously variable. You need the software to run it. Correct. It's getting much more complex. And how do we expect someone who's coming in fresh from college planning to use these pieces of equipment, uh, you, you know, when it's all getting more and more technological? And all this, right. you know, just, so there's, there's that side of it too. And, of course, the old timers like us, us three old guys here are coming to the end of it all. I was just reviewing a uh, a manual for operating a low fork truck, and you know when we when we were in the industry early on, you know, twenty five years ago, it was no big deal. You got the fork truck and you drove it. This thing was like it's like one hundred and fifty pages, and it had it had a it had a computer in it. I'm like, this is a this is a fork truck. Yeah. And uh, I thought, okay, it's uh, the industry is definitely changing. So yeah, I agree with you. We got some real issues there with the complexity of the machines, and when we when we allow people who um, who don't have training or don't understand. Um, and don't understand all the background associated with how to operate that gear and that plan of lift, it, it, it really puts a higher risk for the construction industry in general. Yeah. Well, and I'd love it if you could start with your U.S. Naval Academy graduate here, Jim, and just your history in the nuclear space, because imagine, I just would love to hear from your mind, coming from that space, you know, Rick over the, the Rick Overs <laughs> nuclear Navy to the construction, the maintenance industry, uh, what you've seen and, and just your career. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So like you said, uh, you know, I, you know, I started my career at the Naval Academy and I was trained as an engineer there. And when I left the Naval Academy, I, I, I went into submarines and my first submarine that I joined was in the, it was being overhauled. And so it was in, it was in a million pieces when I showed up and we put the submarine back together. So construction, I've always been building things in my career. And so the first thing I got to do out of the Navy was put that submarine back together and learned a lot about it. And then we took it out to sea. And it, of course it was a nuclear fast attack submarine. And uh, we operated that submarine on, you know, all over the uh, Atlantic and Mediterranean and uh, did some pretty neat things during a cold war with, uh, with that sub. But in the submarine business, um, because it's like an airplane in the way that you, when you go underwater, you're, you're basically flying the thing. And so you have the similar kind of processes that a pilot uses in order to make sure the plane works right. And that's from everything from how they engineer the submarine to how you operate it to the checklist to the various things you got to do. But instead of two guys running the, running the thing like an airplane, you've got 120 men that have to work together in order to make the submarine function correctly. But you learned about quality standards and you learned about all the things. You know, most of the rules in the Navy have been written really on the blood of guys who have made mistakes and so if you look at the submarine's history, um, it has, we've had some tragic events that created things like quality assurance systems and, and uh, they have what's called subsafe and they have these things that make sure that the designs of the submarine are to a standard to keep everybody safe. And so that was my background. Then you add to that the fact that there's a nuclear reactor on that submarine. And so I was trained under Rick Over's program of how to how to operate a nuclear reactor, but not only that, but how it was designed and what what went into making sure we're going to be safe. So so that's a kind of a background. So I left uh, the Navy. I joined a, an outfit called Tennessee Valley Authority, and they were building nuclear plants. And so again, I took the nuclear information that I'd learned in a submarine, and now I was going to go build a a, a nuclear plant with that. So we uh, went in my career with TVA. We uh, I was involved in the the building and the operation of uh, Watts Bar Nuclear Plant. Um, and so we, we put it online again, lots of quality assurance, lots of, of training for operators. So I was involved in operations of that plant. I saw how they, how much uh, we put into training our nuclear operators to make sure that they, they knew what they were doing. And obviously you don't want a guy operating a submarine or a nuclear reactor that doesn't know what he's doing. So lots of training, very similar to the Navy's, uh, but you had to be certified. You had to get qualified. You had external, you know, third party testing of these guys who are operators for these for these plants. And so after that, I, I joined uh, Barnhart Crane Rigging. And this is where my rigging career started uh, and, and, and my op, uh, associates with cranes. And Barnhart was a was a smaller company then. It's it's quite big now. And they've they've built a, a reputation for being very engineering innovative and solving uh, very difficult rigging problems. And so when I joined there um, as an operations manager and engineering manager for them, uh, we were pretty small, but we were getting into much bigger things. The industry was changing. Uh, 
there was a lot of power plants being built at the time. Uh, they were putting in gas turbines everywhere. And so suddenly the country was faced with this situation where you had these 600, 700,000 pound generators and turbines that were being moved all over the country and they were building these gas plants everywhere. And so we grew very rapidly and we had to build special tools. And again, we come in, like Keith said, we came into an industry or I came into an industry that was just barely starting to do things like, how do we design things like spreader bars and what standards should we be using? How do we qualify people uh, to operate this equipment? And so it, it, it was very, uh, uh, compared to what I had just left in the Navy and then with the nuclear, nuclear power industry, um, it seemed like we were, we, we were way behind the times. And so Barnhart built... Um, and this is how I got to know Mike is my uh, uh, I was trying to create um, in our in our uh, company a system of training and qualifying our people because we we learned early on there were two things that prevented accidents and made us more efficient. You had to have good qualified people and you had to have great plans. And this is even before a lot of the standards were written for those things like lift planning. And so we were looking for companies uh, that were training well, and ITI did it well. And so we we actually mocked our our training program after what ITI does, and uh, we created qualification cards for our men for every piece of equipment. We created um, uh, certification programs for them. We we put them through our own training, and so we had very specialized gear that we had to train on. And and there were, uh, you know, there wasn't any kind of training. You know, they basically you'd buy a crane and you throw an operator in there, and you're like, no, we. we We've got to do much better on that. These cranes are becoming more and more sophisticated, like Keith was talking about. So, and, and on top of that, we had a lot of engineers that were working and we started working for nuclear power plants and we started working for companies like Bechtel that demanded a lot more from us than just, you know, a, a napkin sketch kind of design. You know, they, they, they wanted to see what was your quality program? How did you train your people? What, what was the design standards that you used to develop this, this specialized tools? And so, so our company put together a, a pretty extensive quality assurance program, uh, design standards program, um, training programs. And, uh, and, and, and I think that's what helped that company grow and become as good as it is today. Uh, but again, you're starting in an industry that didn't have a lot of those standards. And then, of course, when I talked to Mike about what we were doing, he said, you need to come and join ASME. Mm -hmm. And so I joined ASME through his encouragement. And, and we have built some and, and improved on really good standards that were started and built on those things. So a lift planning standard that's out there now. And Mike and I worked on a, a strand jack um, standard uh, in, in our jacking field, which didn't exist before. And guys like, you know, what Keith was mentioning, using strand jacks, they're incredibly great tools, but there was no standard on how to use them, no standard on how to maintain them or design them. And so, so now you're starting to see the industry really mature to a point where we realize that in order to make sure that things are safe and that we're efficient in our jobs, um, that, that, that you're using design standards and we're now using certification standards and training standards and, and even OSHA's laws have now changed that said, hey, you've got to have a third party verify that that operator is qualified to operate that crane. So, so things are getting much better. Um, and, and so my, my career that way was with, with Barnhart. Was, uh, it was fun to see us grow both from an industry and a company into, into what we're seeing today. But there's still a lot of companies that are, that, that they need to adopt those standards and become, you know, safe and become uh, really efficient at what they do. And, and it's really behind training and certification and around lift planning. And, and then, of course, the engineering piece, which I was deeply involved in, uh, the design standards are super important, too. What are we designing to? What, what margins of safety are we supposed to put on these things like spreader bars or slide systems or, you know, even the new standard we're working on with Keith right now uh, in ASME on platform trailers? Uh, platform trailers are an incredible tool. They can move incredibly big loads, but there's no there's no operating standard. There's no safety standard for how to use them. And ASME right now is working on doing that. We hope that's going to make it much safer. You know, Jim, you just made uh, just reminded me about what the the ASME world really hit a progress point 15 to 17 years ago. That when you opened a document up for overhead cranes, mobile cranes, tire cranes, whatever, it was. Um, vertically supporting the load. And we said to them, um, and I started also working on the winches standard of, as a base mounted drum hoist, basically. If you think about it, we changed, we had them change, we changed the name from base mounted drum hoists to winches because we said things are going horizontal. 
and they're not just freely suspended up loads. We're not hanging everything. We're pulling a lot of stuff. Right. So we went through numerous volumes on rig and new ones at the time, rigging hardware, B30.26 for shackles and dynamometers and all kinds of other uh, hardware components. And then slings, um, jacks. We took jacks, the B30.1 from mechanical and hydraulic, and we added airbags, airlifting bags. We added industrial rollers. Um, we Then we added uh, telescopic hydraulic entry Gantries, systems right. and strand jacks. And, and all of the scopes for those particular uh, volumes were needed to and were changed or enhanced that permitted horizontal work. Right. And once we were able to convince the main committee to permit horizontal work, all the, th all the instructions about blocking, cribbing, uh, anticipated force required to move the load with a winch on an industrial roller set, that it's, it's permissible and, and allowable. You need to calculate or anticipate what your tension will be required based on friction and load weight, and then um, proceed. Or there may be inclines, take those into account, et cetera, uphill or downhill. But we, it was a it was a bit of an arm wrestling match for the old guard and the B thirty committee, who were maybe deep seated overhead crane people and some others that, well, this rigging thing was just a little out of their wheelhouse, and it was just a little uncomfortable for them to say, oh, "We're just going to pull stuff across there." Well, heck yeah, and we're and we're going to use jacks and push things, you know, based on you know support points <clears throat> and so on. So it it was. We fortunately turned the corner and um, it, we, we quit using the word lifting all the time, though that's that lift director, you know, of course, is a, is a right. nom nomenclature that we're stuck with. But but even in the definition of lift director, it's about load handling. LHE has been a new birth word for load handling equipment. That means it can push it, pull it, tug right. it, hoist it, lower it, so whatever it's going to take in whichever direction. And so we've been able to, once we introduce that freedom of thought and freedom of use of the equipment based on a good, solid engineering or planning process, it it took a lot of sting away that, oh, you can't do that with that equipment. Well, yeah, you can. And we actually are allowed by the manufacturer, but we just didn't have any standards that spoke to it. Right. right? So, so it was a really big step. And I compliment the committee and our industry, the volunteers. That's why encouraging you all to join the, you know, join that process, ASME process, is to bring that thinking to the ASME world and and to encourage those folks to let's let's adopt this multi multi use application for these types of equipment versus only thinking lifting up setting down it's it's a lot more than that and we were able to make it yeah yeah you know, just reminded me too you know when I joined the industry and as I think you guys remember um, w what was going on most people thought about lifting with a crane. Well, then they got into modular construction and the modular construction meant that these guys were, you know, the, we were designing great big loads that, that a typical crane was not able to pick up. And so now you have these great big modules for power plants that you're trying to place into things and, and a crane's not going to be able to do it. So, so then guys like Barnhart and Bechtel and these other folks were out there trying to figure out what, how, how are we going to move these big modular loads around? Mm. And this is where platform trailers showed up in a big way. This is where we started getting sliding systems and jacking systems. And now you've got these modular jacking systems that can lift thousands of tons where, where you're not going to find a crane that's going to go out there. Very few in the world can get anywhere close to that. And, and these big North Shore platforms that they were building and things, how to move them around. We want to build them in one big piece and then move them into place. Um, so, so that was really what was driving a lot of these new innovations within lifting and, and moving things horizontally and doing things that were non-crane related. Well, right. a, 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 big, a big thing with that is, I mean, a crane, you look in the manual, there's a rating. It's a tool. It's a self-contained machine. But the sort of lifts that you're talking about there are all engineered applications. They're one-offs, and they need a strong amount of engineering input into them, and that's that's been a a, a change. That's you know as we're big, building bigger, heavier, higher, taller, we're getting into more of this engineered lifting, and that's uh, hmm. so where the team before just com was comprised of an operator and a and riggers on the ground. Well, it demanded less of you because you could go to a crane chart and say, 
right. I want to lift this 200 ton chemical vessel. I can lift this at 50 feet radius using this crane because it says so here in the chart. Put enough boom in, you've got the job sorted. But now it's it's a whole lot different. <laughs> sure. You know, if you even think about it, winches, oh, using winches, rigging blocks and anchor points. What we really show people is you're building a crane laying down mm -hmm. if you want to pull something. So you have to identify what's the actual load going to be imposed on the rigging rigging block anchor points that are over here north 50 feet, rigging points on the load, and then the, the tugger, the the winch, what's its stress going to be? Because mm -hmm. you and you're built, it's almost as you take a mobile crane and lay it over on its side. Now you're going to use that drum and draw drum draw works and shift system to pull a load, right? Mm -hmm. And you're becoming a crane designer using an independent set of tools. And that's where the engineering and planning is so critical because we have to really evaluate what are what's the what's the integrity and capacity of our connection points because we could really be in trouble. We could we can pull things right off the wall if we're not careful. We've really got to require and maybe even load test some of those things to ensure that we've got proper support to to create and execute. Well, I think one one thing that's become apparent in recent years is a move towards a more risk based approach. Uh, you know, to weigh the, the, the extent of your planning, your oversight, the skills of the people and everything is commensurate with the risk of the operation. I mean, in the past, people used to talk about a heavy lift. Hopefully now people are not talking about heavy lifts, they're talking about high risk lifts or critical lifts. Or, and there's been that move away from just defining a lift as getting the attention on the grounds of its weight alone. But, right. but you know, there are there are other other factors which you which would drive you to have uh, more skills, different skills involved. Yeah, you know, I think this is a great place for our industry to be moving is this risk-based approach to how you're doing your planning. You know, the petrochemical industry and the nuclear industry have been doing it for years. If you, you know, you look at any kind of risk-based operational safety, you're going to see the petrochem and nuclear industry have been doing it for years. And we bring those similar types of assessments of we're getting ready to do something. What, what risk is involved? How, how do I want to manage those risks? And really that's the definition of safety, isn't it? It's, it's, we're going to, we're going to adequately manage the risk associated with this job and that makes it safe. And so we're seeing this more and more in our industry. And, and I think it's a good thing as we move into risk-based analysis of our lift plans in order to make it so they really are well planned and they've got they've got a you know an abundance of efficiency built in as we think through it and then as well but what comes along with that is the safety part of it as well and keeping people safe but they're targeted as well you've identified those things that need particular attention right. and you've and you've put effort into that you're not just slavishly following what it says you've got to do but you're, you're doing what you need to do rather than what you're being told to do right and that's, well because what you both have explained is there's no script no there's you have to write it you've got to write the script in advance because there's no script existing and you've got to really create that before you execute. Otherwise people are going to get hurt and, and equipment's going to get wrecked. Right. Yeah. If you think about everything, you know, take like NASCAR racing. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a car guy, I like watching racing and, and you watch how they plan what they do. You know, I mean, some of the Formula One cars can come in and they, they, they make a change out of, of tires in seconds and they're back out on the racetrack. Well, that the planning. Everybody has a has a role, and they've all identified it, and they've communicated it well. There's no difference in the construction industry. As we get ready to make a big lift, who's doing what? What role do you have? What what what's your job in making sure that we're going to do this safely and we're going to do it efficiently? And and so it's that planning process taken to a point of like you said, a script. What's what's Keith's role? What's my role? What is the crane operator going to do? And we all talk about it before we do it, and then it comes off usually pretty well if you plan your right. job well and, and and everybody says well you made it look good, easy well you look at a you look at a race car team it makes it look easy too but the amount of planning it took for them to do a two second turnaround in a pit uh, is no different than the amount of planning that really lifts ought to be uh, done with where we're thinking about especially the higher risks or bigger bigger loads you've really got to consider so many things and it, and it makes it so our, our our industry moves in a way that you know we're not having these big disasters. Um, and, and that we are planning our jobs well. And it might not even be the big stuff. It could be little, picking right. the, something up with a fork truck. Did you think through how are you going to, how are you going to do that? And just, did you communicate with your truck driver so you don't flip this truck over when you pick off the load, you know, those kind of things. Mm -hmm. um, so it can be simple or it can be big, but both of them along the lines, you said is scripting it so everybody knows what they're doing. 
you know, you you were not able to attend some of the ASME meetings for the P30 lift planning group, but there were probably 30 industry uh, participants around and it took a few years to get it really organized and developed. But at the end of the day, um, this group of folks uh, were, they were able to put together about a four page uh, planning guide that's in the appendix, I believe. And it, what if a person would get that volume, get that P30.1 volume and open that up and look at the appendix, those four pages push because it's not just centered towards mobile cranes. It's, it's all of the equipment we've just been talking about is is able to be plugged in. But what that planning guide actually shows is pushes you to get into the personnel. There's a, like 11 different subject elements in any lift plan that we we came to conclusion. So. But out of those 11, each one is specifically addressed and it's it's the people, places and things. Right. So the, the people side for for qualifications, competency, how many folks do you need, what assignments and titles and roles do they have to have and where the position, uh, how's the communication going to happen? And it, it just goes right down the list and then it deals with the LHE, the load handling equipment, uh, pre-inspected its use, its capacity. Um, it's it's foundation and, and and stability, all those things, everything to do with its its performance and the operator that's going to be there with it or operators. And then it gets into the the load itself and all the elements is a lo- could the load collapse in mid lift because we rigged it in the wrong place. Right. Mm-hmm. And the, so the rigging elements come into that. So but what Jim and, and Keith were had very big hands in was getting that big checklist together and it pushes a lift planner and a lift director to con- to a consideration point and all of those have to do with risk because if because some parts of that may be very very risky you go to certain certain environments and your your work pool isn't um, they're just not used to doing this kind of thing the equipment can do what you're asking it to do and the load's going to maintain and have an uh, an integrity uh, that won't fall apart, but we just don't, we're really short person power of having folks that know how to execute that. Maybe have one person or two, two people in that whole crew out of 24 that all of a sudden we've got a deficiency and we've got a very high risk condition or situation going on, or it's something they only do once every 10 years. Let's say at a big dam and they're going to do a, a generator overhaul. Well, almost nobody was here when they did it the last time. Yeah. So we don't have super well-trained and informed people. That's why writing procedures is so critical. But these guys help put together a really good risk review, lift plan, overview uh, document that I think almost anybody in our industry could pick up and look at it. And if they really are diligent about going right down through the through the boxes that push the question on all the subjects, they will minimize risk if they truly address it and address it, you know, intelligently with a group of folks, you know, assigned to that activity, right? It's not just a one person thing. Well, you all were a part of that. I was just curious, the, over time, it sounds like there's been a several little inflection points that have helped evolve the lift planning, lift planning activities. And from, from Barnhart's perspective, as a, as a really a specialized rigging contractor, you all do it every day. Uh, there's construction companies that don't do it every day, yeah. like Beck. I mean, you have Bechtel crews that might. I mean, I'm sure that they're um, calling up Keith if they're doing something very complicated in your team. But what have you guys seen? I mean, how far evolved is the lift planning activity set and in, in lift planning? Um, it sounds like the documentation's in place fairly well with the P30 document. But where are we at in the in the ball game? You know, what's still def- what's what's deficient? What's deficient or within the industry or specifically? Yeah, and just conducting lift planning activities, yeah. Well, I think one of the issues we're all facing at the moment is with, with manual rigging, bull rigging. As, as Jim was saying, you know, we're, we're building faster, quicker, higher, heavier, and we're, we particularly in our particular part of the construction industry are stuffing a lot of pipe into modules that are already complete, whereas in the past we might have put them in as we progressed the module. But in order to contract the the schedule, we're, we're, we're getting the boxes finished before the pipe's ready, or sometimes before it's even been fully designed. You know, so it's 
or having to, to, to lift these weirdly shaped pieces of pipe with valves and things on strange centers of gravity. And we're, 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 we're faced on that side of it with a, an ever more complex handling operation because you've got to feed it in from one side, you've got to manipulate it, you've got to move it, you've got to hand it off and, until you eventually get it where you're going to get it. And that requires quite a lot of skill. And it requires more skill than the average rigger that you're going to find straight out of the union hall has. Um, and, and so we're finding that deficiency. You know, we, we, we're, not, we're not finding people who are long experienced in the field with some engineering ability in order to be able to figure out what's really going on when you've got multiple lines of support and they're all at weird angles and you're hanging off of the roof and you're pulling and heaving and tugging and shoving and pushing. And, you know, to analyze that is difficult. It's difficult even for a skilled engineer to figure out what's going off. And uh, and yet we're just sort of handing the task across to these people. So there's a real skills deficiency with manual rigging. And that's why we've all been working recently in the industry to try and to try and upgrade uh, that. Try address and... address that. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Provide some guidelines. That's that's one deal. Yeah. Oh, um, one of the one of the other things I see, um, and uh, recently after I left Barnhart, I was doing some general construction work and and I saw it very clearly as we were working, uh, the, the lift planning process helps you identify the coordination that needs to happen between different, um, not only trades disciplines, but between the structural engineer and the architect and the, you know, and, the, and, 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 and the civil engineer, um, those coordination pieces, especially when you're moving big loads or you're bringing in big equipment, like these cranes put down some incredible loads, uh, and reactions. And in order to make sure that, you know, if, if, if I'm going to put a piece of lifting gear, even like a fork truck, you know, up on top of a mezzanine, who's looking at the mezzanine to make sure that the mezzanine can actually carry that load. And it, and it could be a small fork truck, but that mezzanine may only be a two inch thick concrete pad. And he puts his fork truck up there and picks something up and now he caves the floor in. And so this, this coordination between the different disciplines of engineering as well as the disciplines of the craft and get them to identify, hey, someone needs to look at the floor before I bring up, you know, I mean, I mean, we've had forklifts that, you know, weigh in excess of 100,000 pounds, just the forklift, and you're going to drive it across somebody's, somebody's floor uh, or a parking garage, I mean, you've, you've got an enormous risk there. And if you don't identify the coordination that needs to happen, did, did a structural engineer look at the you know, look at the parking garage and make sure I can bring that that crane in and put that outrigger down that's putting down, you know, 80,000 pounds of reaction uh, in a very small area. And so those kind of things are also, we, we you know, we've got to heighten the awareness of the coordination to make sure that you don't just, you know, I can't just bring a crane in and set it up anywhere, especially these very big cranes that we're talking about or, or a platform trailer or, you know, even a, you know, even a concrete truck. You don't go driving that around a site without knowing where you're going. Yeah. And you've got to have a good coordination, and, and that's that means a lot of work together. We we see a lot of issues, not so much with the heavier end of lifting, because they all get a lot of attention. It's true, but a lot of the issues you're seeing every day on the web and all the rest of it are relatively small machines that have gone over for one reason or another. And I, I've got a real bee in my bonnet about you go and ask the crane driver, you know, the operator of the machine. You say, well, what what's your outrigger load that you're putting down here? And half the time they can't tell you. They have no idea what load they're imparting into the ground. You say, well, what's the ground good for? They have no idea. Right. They're just going to turn them at the job site. They're going to stick a four foot by four foot pad underneath the outrigger and they're going to go for it. So, I, you know, there's a lot of tools out there by which you can, you can figure out what the outrigger loads are. But, you know, and if you're going to do an engineered lift, you can do all that stuff. But if you're just going to send someone from a, you know, from a depot to go and do a lift, he doesn't have access to that, right. or the operator, whoever it is. So I would really like to see, particularly the smaller end of the cranes, that they would put on the side of the cab prominently, maximum outrigger load this thing can ever impose is 50 tons or whatever it is. And then you know if you're going to turn up with outrigger pads of a certain size, the worst pressure you can ever impose is going to be this. Mm -hmm. So all you then got to do is to go to the people, the controlling entity in OSHA's terms, and, and, and say, you know, I intend to impose not more than this on your site. 
Now, if you want to do an engineered deal where, you know, you're not going to go with the 50 tons because it's only really 30, that's fine. But, you know, if you don't have that information, you know, equip your cranes with pads of a certain size, knowing that you'll never impose more than 5 KSF or whatever. Right. And uh, do, do yeah, that. Do you. you know, the, the planning that you all are talking about, too, and the education of the folks and some of the prep, prep work, I think it works really well uh, for the professional crane and rigging service companies. Mm -hmm. And where, where we see the training really needed are in the corporate world of people that own the property and own cranes and manage their maintenance people to use those cranes and or tuggers, winches, other equipment to perform their own maintenance, not, not inviting in outside service groups, mm -hmm. but performing it themselves. And I think that's where we have a breakdown a bit with a, a lack of the planning training. They don't really, most of the time, we're starting to get folks uh, from steel companies and others, we, they're signing up for lift director programs. Uh, we, we understand we're lacking in some of these tiered areas. I, I listed out, we kind of got some questions the other day about well, if you were going to build an, a, a perfect rigging uh skill set within an organization a company because this really kind of goes uh, it's not really talking about the professional service groups it's about the people that you know, it, you know it's a 10 to 1 ratio mills, of refineries, yeah, all these mills, others paper yeah. mills and so on so i said well because there's probably six or seven levels i said um you know we and we kind of charted this out i said well at least maybe everybody ought to have a safety awareness around cranes and rigging because people can get pinched crushed and pushed just working around cranes and loads that are coming up there. And there may be a millwright or a pipe fitter or an electrician or a carpenter. And maybe they're just a laborer and that's just uh, around a load, but he can, he or she can be hurt just as badly or worse than anybody. They're just not expecting and understanding what the reaction is going to be. So, but, but a safety awareness level, another level would be basic rigging. So we're trying to figure, and when we approach clients with this and they, and they understand and they, with an audit, they, they understand we have deficiencies. We've got gaps. What what's what does this plan look like? And so, from awareness standpoint, for everybody, a uh, whole host of folks probably need that basic uh, rigging and inspection type level. There's a, then the then as as this as the intensity of the programs go up, the group size gets smaller, and then so some folks that need to make on the fly decisions, intermediate level, or then a master rigger level where they've got calculate weight center gravity these are the calculation stages of rigging as well sling tensions and 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 fr friction etc so and then you get up to um uh, they they're at a certain point they need lhe training they need load handling equipment training they need some exposure to understanding load charts or capacities of the equipment they're using with their rigging because before before they get to a lift plan or lift director stage they've got to have that lhe embedded in their minds that they can they can grasp and, and and absorb what are those rated capacities and what are my limits because they don't understand the limits they're going to hurt somebody so part of that lhe is there then the lift planning lift planning lift director and finally very small at the top but very critical is the rigging engineer right so there's a whole leg maybe for the operator side of all those things but from the rigging and load moving side that's that that's that appears to be to us where those six or seven levels need to be addressed and it is a, it's a reducing number of folks that are involved in that. You don't need everybody trained at the lift planner, lift director level, but but the, but but when an employer starts to understand that corporate, let's say at a steel mill, they say, oh, all right, so we we understand all of our employees where we can actually fit them into that. And the, the by the, when you get to lift director, lift planner, you're probably talking about five to eight people, maybe ten people in a you know in a site of, of four hundred people maybe rigging engineering two to four you know so you don't it's not masses but you need some folks grounded in it if they're going to perform their own maintenance and their own hard work at their facilities and not really pull in some of these outside service companies then they really they're they're needing as much training and knowledge as a professional crane and rigging service companies mm -hmm. if they're just not going to use them they're going to use all their own equipment and people they need to bulk up and build up that foundational base, the knowledge base and the equipment base. So I see to me, that's our a gap we're trying to close. Mm -hmm. I think that's our from our organization standpoint, that's where we're really trying to serve 
and and bring bring the proficiency and, and the professionalism up in within that that uh, industry sector, yeah. right? Well, it's 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 funny. All the big tower crane collapses are all over the news. Uh, big crane heavy lift accidents are all over the news. But it's the bulk of the, the bulk of the real risk and um, uh, volume is in industrial sites where all the there's a lot of lifting that happens that's under under twenty tons. You know, yeah, yeah. And, uh, by folks that just don't do it every day, and um, so that's that's always an ITI's core area of focus. But it's uh, uh, I think it goes back to your point a little bit that there it's not it's not ever, never about the heaviness of an object. It's all about the risk associated with mm-hmm. the with the move. Um, so interesting stuff. I, I was curious what your guys' thoughts. I, I always encourage young people to get in this industry because I don't think it could ever be um, automated. Uh, so the rigging rigging activities. Uh, certainly a crane could be automated uh, the operation of a crane or uh, some, at some, some day there's um, Komatsu rolled out a cabless dump truck at Con Expo in 2017, you know, so dump trucks at, at open pit mines are uh, certainly uh, autonomized, but I was just curious your, your thoughts, what manufacturers are really pushing the envelope, uh, whether it's cranes or groups like Enterpack and folks that are making, uh, first of all, I know there's opinions in the ta- on the table about some of these really complex products being made um, that are that are really intended for use by really specialized people that are now available on the market, you know, for anyone to grab. But um, how do you feel about um, any any manufacturer stepping out in your mind um, that's uh, certainly pushing the envelope when it comes to uh, certainly technology, but also trying to automate some things and reduce risk, I suppose, in, in the operation of their machine. And it might be a jack or a crane or a, um, there's now uh, tel- I mean, tel- telescopic hydraulic gantry systems that are super dangerous. Um, so I'm just curious about those, those devices getting in to uh, untrain people's uh, hands, <clears throat> how you all feel about that. Well, it's... it's it- <laughs> <laughs> It's no secret that I'm no big fan of telescopic hydraulic gantries. Uh, I mean, if you're going to create a portal like that that has no cross bracing and all the rest of it in it, it's going to be very, very susceptible to any kind of side loading. Uh, it's just just inherent in the nature of things. You've got a very, a very narrow base to each of the jacking units. And particularly as you get taller and taller and taller with the things, any slight discrepancy across the track it makes a lot of difference at the top right. and any kind of side loading that you're inducing through possibly even when you first lift the load if you don't have the slings exactly plumb mm. there's, a, there's a there's a sideways uh, component to the tension which acts at the head of the system and they just can't they can't handle it i mean they're good for one or two percent and that's it you know the, the jacking systems that i grew up with were, were very tolerant of ignorance you know these mm. things aren't and uh, you've really got to be on the ball, but they're, they're all they're all pushing these things towards uh, transport companies. You know why why hire a crane? You know you can lift this thing yourself and load your own trailer. Mm. You know it's it's it yeah. needs a lot of very careful setup and it needs a lot of skill to see what's going on. You know load transfer as well between the legs. If you're not careful, you can get all out of phase with the legs. Right. Now I know end up packing people like that. Uh, you know, got some pretty good uh, monitoring systems built into their latest generation stuff, but uh, still, you need a lot of skill to work these things yeah. to, to spot when it's not going right. And yeah, that's yeah. that's it, you know. Just yeah, yeah, I think that's the big point. Is like you, you know, it's not a it's not a forget it type of system. You know, you got to. I mean, the more we automate it, that's great. But if you don't have people understand what they're looking for, and they're just pushing a button and 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 watching instead of actually being part of the lift and understanding what's going on and monitoring the system, you can get yourself in trouble. And they have had some systems that have done it where they the operators weren't paying attention. The automated system was doing what it's supposed to do. And it, it doesn't realize it's in trouble until it's too late. Mm-hmm. And so, so for those things like gantries and that, I, you know, I think you've still got to have very qualified people operating them. I don't care how automated you get with them because the margins of safety are very, very small. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just like automated cranes. I mean, um, one thing I do like that I'm seeing in the industry is where we're getting the crane operators out of the cab, standing next to the rigger. Uh, I mean, I saw it in the nuclear industry when they operate big overhead cranes. The overhead crane guys have always done it. They've got a pendant. He's standing right next to the rigger. 
and we're and we're talking, but his communication's good. He's bringing the hook down. He's doing those things. And you see it now with some of the bigger cranes in the world are now they're they're operating off of a off of a you know computer screen, and so he's out of the cab. He's over there doing the work, and I, and I think you're going to see more and more of that. And 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 I think that probably has some some good benefits to it, especially you know if you're 500 feet away from that crane operator. Tough for him to see you, let alone, you know, just now you got radio communications, those kind of things. But if he's standing right next to you and he's operating that hook, man, I really like that. I mean, that that seems like that's a good way to go as we as we bring uh, the operator to the, you know, bringing the hook and the operator together seems like a really good 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 way to go with these bigger cranes and some of these, uh, uh, like the platform trailers are doing that now too. You know, the operator's standing there and he's he's functioning away from the machine while he can watch and see things. And I think you're going to see more of that. You know, these big strand jack rigs have got pretty sophisticated systems. We, we, we've lifted some uh, hangar roofs in, uh, in, 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 in Doha, for instance, and places like that for 10,000 tons, and you've got multiples and multiples of heavy-duty strand jacks, and all that information is being felt, you know, fed back to one guy who's sitting there with a laptop, good graphics and all the rest of it. You can see exactly what's going yeah. on, any one of the points, and if the thing gets out of tolerance, it'll... It'll shut down till the till the, the, the defect is corrected, you know. So there's there's a lot kind of stuff going on. You know, when we're seeing that smart technology today and some of the advanced cars that are out on the road and sold in the last four or five years and this year, uh, they redirect you lane lane uh, uh, of deviation or uh, adaptive cruise control um, or uh, avoidance collision avoidance. And so they're they're forcing they're pushing the car unless you really grab that wheel they're actually manipulating that car to mm -hmm. um, stay centered, even uh, drop the speed zone from fifty five to thirty five. The car literally slows down to accommodate to the thirty five speed limit until you progress and go back up. The 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 information going in and the electronics uh, and the computer systems that are driving it certainly would be adaptable to, to crane and lifting load and equipment operations, especially when I really like in the idea of overload avoidance, right? Um, you can pull on it, but you just can't go past capacity. I mean, that's, those are things. If we could do that, uh, you know, on the big Brontus, the, uh, the, the super large man lift systems that used by uh, linemen and tower uh, groups, 250 foot booms, they have uh, they have outrigger sensors because you've got a precious cargo of people up in the basket on the flying carpet, but they've got outrigger sensors that will not permit the unusual loading that can can occur either by ground failure and or a bleed off, uh, and they'll they'll shut that system down and or cause the boom to in effect the alarms will set off, but the operator at the base will bring that boom back up to relocate the loading and pressure to the outriggers to get that down and satisfy the problem The if we can, if we can implement those tools we're seeing already in the automotive industry and bring them uh, and, and fully engage them as people are doing Lee bear is probably a leader in that D mag and others, but they can integrate that tech into the cranes. That's, that's going to make a lot more bulletproof, right? And, and even for, even for that crane to be purchased by, as we were talking earlier, a steel mill and their maintenance department. Now they've got a smarter crane or smarter load handling equipment to help them lower their risk mm -hmm. from mistakenly abusing the crane to some overload or some tip mm -hmm. condition accidentally. Right. And so we need to make it, we're, we're going to see the cranes and the load handling equipment get, get smarter that, it's going to take a, some pressure off the operator in effect. Yeah. But as Jim said, they got to recognize what the problem is and then potentially react to that. That's going to, that that's where some of that training is going to be really vital is to understand what the signs are. What's it telling me? Right. It's trying to prevent this issue uh, to for for total catastrophic event. But now what is what do I need to do as the operator to recover this thing before we really have a wreck? So that's where the training is going to be important. I think, you know, within the industry and the standard setting and all the rest of it, there's, there's still this uh, somewhat of a, a reluctance to accept that cranes these days are not just providing information to the operator. They're, they're actual management systems. Mm. You know, the, the, the computer is is making decisions. And the, the old, you know, the old timers and all the rest of it, the, the operator was king. 
Right. Yep. In fact, you didn't even have to have load monitoring at one point. I mean, the, the guy just got in the cab and pulled the levers and right. watch out for the out trigger lifting. And uh, and then we got into, well, the safety devices and those information devices. Now we're talking about management systems where some of the decision-making is being taken away uh, from the operator. You know, potentially he can override it when he, you know, to, to as you're saying, automatic cutoff and all the rest of it. Well, the, the guy can can acknowledge that and correct it and all the rest of it. But there needs to be a change in thinking, you know. Um, there has to be an acceptance. Like, you're sitting in on these ASME meetings, there has to be an acceptance that the cranes are going to be making decisions. They are going to cut you off when you're getting into dangerous areas. They are going to stop you doing things you shouldn't be doing. And that 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 sits a little hard with some people. Right. Yeah. It's, it is interesting, though. It seems like, you know, whether it's the defense industry or automotive, those two industries specifically seem to propel new technologies like computer vision. I mean, the, the blind spot checker or backup cameras in your car. We see a ton of cameras being applied to cranes now. Tower cranes have them all over the place. There's companies trying to make the, vir the virtual or digital twin using the tower crane hook as a camera in a way to collect yeah. the job site information on a second by second basis. But um, cameras even just imagine on bridge cranes or red cranes of avoiding if there's someone in a pinch point, it could shut the crane down. You know, I think that is very close to coming, but I think you're right that the acceptance once they once um, people have the car that does it for them, the acceptance is a little easier because it gets it hits home for them. They realize it's helpful um, and it, it can have buy in maybe on the job site. But you're right. It's a it's a bit of a culture change. Um, for there's, sure. there's still a lot of talk about remote operating cranes, you know. Mm -hmm. Whether we'll ever see it, I don't know. How I feel about it, I don't know. But yeah, but, uh, I would yeah, imagine. It's, it's certainly, don't you all think the tower crane, tower crane specifically, would be the first, maybe the first place that could happen, right? I mean, well, they would lend themselves a lot better than saying a large crawler crane. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but again, as you as you introduce more and more technology into the machine, it means that you've got more and more need to make sure that operator understands the technology, mm -hmm. the, the crane, the decisions it's making, what is it doing, um, why won't it work today, uh, what are the limitations. He's got to be more and more versed in it. It's no longer I've got three levers I've got to worry about and a couple of foot pedals. Uh, now he's got a computer in front of him mm -hmm. that has a, a very sophisticated sensing system and it and it now he's got to understand all the things that the, the crane is trying to do for him mm -hmm. in in order to be a, a good safe operator and not just get frustrated and bypass everything and, and run the crane. Yeah, the, the, the operator is getting no real life feedback. You, you're insulated from the real world, and I'm a bit worried about that. That's a good. That's a good mm -hmm. point. The one of the uh, things I think any crane manufacturer can do for as they sell that equipment, they really want to have a robust training program on their computer system, mm -hmm. their LMI, their whole dashboard for all operators are in there because it's, it's, uh, uh, we're even seeing it today where OSHA calls for a qualification or evaluation of operators and software is one of those questions for getting an operator up into the machine. He's certified to run, let's say large telescopic cranes and getting on a hundred ton uh, hydraulic but the evaluation process required for construction crane operators, the employer really is charged to identify, are they familiar with the software and can they manipulate through to set up the parameters, configuration, all those things with the crane? If they can't, well, you know, we've got to we go back. We've, we've got a learning gap. We're going to have to fill it, plug it and get it, get this person up on its feet. So they, so getting the, getting them uh, really informed about the system, you become then a much better master of the machine and you're not at its whim and whim, you know, whimsical issues. You're not, you're not always lost about what's happening with the machine. You're actually out in front of it. And I think that's kind of what you were talking about. They need to be proactive and in complete grasp of what the machine's doing. Right. Well, and it becomes more difficult too, as you get, um, I mean, you look at our certification processes for our crane operators, they're, they're in classes of cranes, but each crane itself can be so complicated yeah. that it, it, it can take an operator a couple of days to go through a manual that's, you know, several inches thick and then figure out the computer system. And it, 
it, it's the same class as the crane he just got off of, but it maybe leaves a D-mag and he's going over here to a Lee Bear or a Grove or, or one of those other cranes. Uh, it's it's the same class, but it's a, it's a different operating system. It's a yeah. different control system. He's got he's to now bring himself up to speed on those things. And so it, 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 it becomes a very complex process to make sure not only is he qualified in the class, but does he know how to operate the specific crane because they're no longer just general uh, controls. You have a you have an operating system that you now must learn. Right. Well, that's why I think it was a really good move the way that OSHA went with this. With the evaluation process? Yeah. yeah you bet. The, the, the other issue that uh, you, you face is that, I mean, if you're a if you're a crane company, then the guy is going to be allocated to a crane and he's going to gain experience right. over time. And that person is going to become very competent in the use of that machine. But if you're just renting, you know, bare renting a machine mm. to a job site and you're oh, going boy. to go you're going to go and bring in someone to operate it. That guy is probably, well, he may, may never have seen that crane before. Right. And now he, he, you know, that operator has got to get up to speed. You yeah. know, it's a whole different world than, than living with a machine day in, day out and getting to know its, its ways. Sure. Yeah. yeah, I think that was a good rule to make sure that the, you're putting the responsibility on the on the employer to make sure if you're renting that crane, that operator has got time to know that and you're certifying that he's, he's qualified on it. Sure. So mm -hmm. it was a good move. Mm -hmm. Well, very good. I don't have any other questions for you guys, but we could talk all day. So anything else you want to share or things that you just, any other bees in your bonnet, Keith or ideas you guys want to. No, you don't want to go there. <laughs> <laughs> Plenty of bees in my bonnet. Yeah. <laughs> now we'll, uh, no, no, I think the things we've been talking about are right. You know, the industry, as we continue to move in ways to make us, you know, safer and more efficient, it really does circle around the two things we've been talking about today. And it's the, it's the, it's the training of the rigor, the operator, and it's the planning of the work that they're going to do. If you put those two things together, you've got a pretty good shot of making sure that your job's going to go fairly well because you planned it. And it's going to be safe because you've looked at all the contingencies and you've managed the risk points because you thought about them. And so, we, you know, we found if you put those two together, you're, you're probably going to be very successful. And then conversely, if you don't, uh, your, your risk of your job goes up significantly and people are going to get hurt. I'm constantly being asked, you know, what should be in a lift plan? And we create these artificial strata of risk. We say, you know, from here down over, all you need to do is this. From here to here, you need to do that. And from here up over, you need to do this. And it's artificial because it's every every one's unique and it's it's on a kind of sliding scale, you know. It's and I say, you know, what do you want in a lift plan? You put in a lift plan what you need to put in a lift plan. Right. That the content of that plan should be sufficient to describe the activity, how you're gonna go about it, and how you're gonna manage the risk. And you know, if you're the person who's gonna go out there and and, and uh, be doing the work, you're gonna to want to see in that plan that information is necessary to go and conduct it in the manner that the planner intended you to. But they're not the only target audience. You've also got people like, you know, on a, on a large project, you'll have a site manager, for instance, on a, a safety guy. And all these people are looking at different aspects of the activity. So the information they're looking for is not necessarily the same as the information the guy in the field is looking for. Guy in the field wants to know where to put the crane and all the rest of it. What sequence is all going to happen in? Site manager is looking at the risk of the operation. He's saying, have you thought this all through? Did you consider this? Did you consider that? You know, what, what impact are you going to have on other stuff that's going on around the job site? Sure. You know, then we're going to shut this road. And then, so that the plan should have in it whatever the plan needs to have in it. But we shouldn't be so rigid as to say, well, I don't need to do that because it doesn't say I've got to do it. <laughs> you know, it's... It's a good point. I mean, you look at all the work you've got on a construction site, it might be lifting a 200 you know, ton vessel, it might be unloading a, a, a thing, a rebar. And so there's different planning, there's different risk associated with each one. And are you, are you going to involve everyone in unloading the rebar? And it maybe, but I, you know, probably not. And so, so the lift plan has to be able to, to, to move with the work as well. Yeah. The more complicated things, we want to have a much more robust review, but we also want the craft level guy to be able to put a lift plan together, a skill of the craft type of lift plan and communicate it to his crew and do the work without, without involving engineers and all these other people that, you know, you never get the work done. Or you know, producing so. a whole lot of paperwork is totally useless. Right. Yeah, that's right. Right. Yeah, it goes back to your point about the cross getting – cross-discipline communication you know that's why i love the industry the the activity set that we teach is because it affects 
uh, everybody, just about. I mean, every craft, every union hall teaches rigging. And uh, you could have a, in a steel mill, you have three or four different departments mm-hmm. that are affected in a, in a load movement. Obviously, a construction site, it's always multi, multi crafts. So I'm excited to see where we can take like lift planning and rigging engineering training um, and also uh, work what, what might get into colleges eventually. I know University of Houston, for example, has a construction management program and they were very keen on working with us to add more rigging engineering topics to that program. Um, but if you can, uh, the more awareness I think you can bring to all disciplines about the risk and potential severity of those activities would be, uh, fantastic. So it's, um, I like where we're heading and it seems like we've come a long way. I, uh, some of those, some of the stories I've heard in the seventies and eighties when you guys were coming up is, uh, can be, uh, we've come a long way. Unsettling. You know, yeah. right. Yeah. We have made a lot of strides and. Well, I'm most concerned about right now is is we're about we may be at a point where we're topping out with a, a retirement age of some folks in in all of our industry segments. The attrition rate, job changes, all of that, uh, knowledge and skill sets go away with some of that, and then finding um, new folks to enter into this industry, and that's a, a real struggle for all uh, mm-hmm. to get through be, because of the desire, choice, or selection of what types of industry some of the folks that are from 22 to 35 want to get into. This is an exciting industry, but it's not for everybody. Mm -hmm. So, but we need to attract them and, and get them, get them involved. But I'm, I'm, I'm concerned we're making such great strides. I'm not sure we're not going to have a dip over the next five to 10 years before we come back up because, because of this outflow of competence, folks in certain areas and the replug of new folks. Yeah. So uh, I, I love, I love how we've made this progress, but I just, I don't know that it's immediately sustainable with what's happening to our workforce. So I'd really encourage kids to start now kids, I say 22 to 35 or 40 really consider is this, this is a, a really good, it's a, it's a great series portion of our industry is a load handling. And uh, if they have any desire, it's not uh it's not all that backbreaking, uh, you know. It's uh, it's fun, and uh, people get uh, they get accomplishment out of it, and uh, so it's uh, should be considered right along with everything else that the folks might be exposed to as for career and occupation. Yeah. Absolutely. Hmm. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us today. We had a um, fun evening and weekend with you guys both, and and an early morning today. So appreciate you getting up with us and having a conversation. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Okay. Thanks for listening to this month's ITA Lights podcast. If you liked this episode, please make sure to leave a like, share, and comment. Our guests today were Mike Parnell, Keith Anderson, and Jim Yates. ITA Lights is a production of Industrial Training International. For additional insights on upcoming ITA Lights events, visit our website, www.lights.org.